Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Uh, I am Rob Saldin. I'm the director of ethics and public affairs and a professor of political science here at the University of Montana, director of ethics and public affairs at the Mansfield Center. Uh, tonight's event featuring Larry Diamond is part of our celebration this year of the Man Mansfield Center's 40th anniversary. The center was created by an act of Congress in 1983, and we seek to bridge divides and foster globally minded leaders of integrity in honor of the legacy and the enduring lessons of Senator and Ambassador Mike Mansfield and his wife, Maureen. Now, of course, our, uh, our 40th anniversary comes at a time when our country is facing challenges, the likes of which we haven't seen in generations. And we've had events in recent years and uh, we've seen a lot of polarization. And this has, I think, provoked understandable and widespread concern about the status of American democracy and the future of American democracy. And, you know, notably, this is not just a domestic thing, right? The, the forces that we see at work here in our own country can be seen abroad as well. And uh, it seems to me, at least, our, our current predicament, it should serve as a, as a stark reminder that constitutional democracy uh, does not run on autopilot. It's not a, a default setting. Um, it's not a set it and forget it operation. Um, on the contrary, and uh, as Mike Ma Mansfield uh, counseled, maintaining a healthy democracy requires constant work and a shared commitment from, from leaders and from citizens to a certain set of principles, certain set of rules, certain set of norms, and the job of maintaining a healthy democracy, it, uh, it, it never ends, right? This is something that needs constant tending to. But uh, as I think our speaker tonight will agree, uh, the juice is worth the squeeze. Uh, <laughs> now in, uh, in, in future weeks, uh, we'll continue exploring these matters. And I'd like to draw your attention um, uh, specifically, I know you got some flyers out there that, that, that list a number of events, but, but a couple I'll just mention here. On uh, Wednesday, September 27th, we'll be hosting the former US ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, and the week after that, on Thursday, October 5th, we've got an event featuring former Congresswoman Liz Cheney and our new Mansfield Center board uh, chair, uh, former Governor Mark Roscoe. Um, but, to, but tonight, tonight, yes, indeed, yes. <laughs> There's the governor right there. <laughs> um, tonight, though, it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce Larry Diamond. Um, Professor Diamond, uh, quite simply, is America's leading scholar of democracy. And it is an honor to have him with us. He's spent nearly his entire career at Stanford University where he is currently a senior fellow at both the Hoover Institution and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Professor Diamond is also a founding editor of the Journal of Democracy, and he's a senior consultant at the National Endowment for Democracy. His most recent book, came out in 2020 and is titled Ill Winds, Saving Democracy from Russian Rage, Chinese Ambition, and American Complacency. It's been um, hailed across the political spectrum for uh, at once diagnosing what it is that, uh, that ails us and providing a roadmap for recovery. So please help me welcome Professor Larry Diamond. Uh, I really have to thank you, Rob, for that very generous introduction. I should just hire you to come along with me around the country when I have to do presentations because nobody can introduce me better, it seems. Um, and I thank the Mansfield Center and certainly congratulate it uh, on this august uh, period of its 40th anniversary. It actually turns out that the National Endowment for Democracy uh, this fall is, set, uh, 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 is celebrating its 40th anniversary. Uh, how many people here have ever heard of it? 
Yeah, well, it's a congressionally funded uh, organization uh, to assist and support people around the world that are trying to achieve, maintain, and deepen democracy. Uh, and the concept was launched uh, in a very famous speech. It's called the Westminster speech that President Ronald Reagan uh, gave uh, in Westminster, the House of Parliament, in June of 1982. And then it was established by the Congress on a bipartisan basis and lifted off um, in 1983. And that was around the time I was uh, beginning my career studying democracy globally around the world in Africa, then in Asia. I've lived on both continents uh, and taught on both continents. <clears throat> and um, in Latin America, uh, the former Soviet Union, after it became the former Soviet Union and the former communist countries and even the Middle East and North Africa. I mean, th this has been my arena uh, for studying democratic development, democratic decay, democratic aspirations, democratic transitions. I have to tell you that um, even though I am um, actually politically and intensely interested and occasionally engaged person uh, and, um, and have been very proud of the achievements of American democracy, intensely interested in, and I'm old enough to be someone who knows the career of Mike Mansfield, you know, somewhat well, uh, and was certainly, I can say without lying, an admirer of his, I never dreamed I, I literally never dreamed that I would have to worry about the survival of American democracy. It's been democracy everywhere else in the world um, that I've been focused on. And it's only been in the last uh, decade or so, uh, really even maybe the last eight years, that I have turned to you know, a somewhat serious study of and in a way advocacy about democracy in the United States, because I think our democracy is troubled, embattled, uh, and in real danger of failing. Uh, that is breaking down and becoming an authoritarian regime in some way. And we came very close to a breakdown of American democracy on January 6th of 2021. I don't think I need to explain that. I'll be happy to defend it later if I need to. Uh, so now I'll give you the rest of my lecture. Um, I think a core problem uh, and a window onto all the other problems we have uh, with the increasing fragility and trouble of American democracy is that we have become increasingly polarized and really poisonously, dangerously polarized. Uh, and by polarized, I mean people, politicians, and ordinary people separating themselves into separate and completely incompatible, opposing, and mutually demonizing camps. And democracy can't survive that. You know, I, I've spent really now, I think I can say, pretty close to 50 years studying uh, breakdowns of democracy around the world, both historically with the Weimar Republic in Germany and the Chile in 1973 uh, and others more recently, including some of the coups in Africa. And uh, one of the most uh, common precursors of democratic breakdown and failure is extreme toxic and violence-inducing uh, political polarization. The separation of people into really enemy political camps uh, that regard each other as an existential threat to their values and the future of the country as they want to see it. Um, democracy requires uh, as the great Yale political scientist Robert Dahl wrote repeatedly, some minimum degree of mutual tolerance, mutual respect, and mutual restraint. Mutual restraint means that when you hold political power, 
you don't do everything that you conceivably could do and engage in every abuse you think you might be able to get away with to uh, wield power and even per perhaps barricade yourself in power. You accept the limits of political power. Uh, you accept um, the outcome of elections when they're finally uh, adjudicated and resolved. Uh, and you accept the right of the political opposition to come to power and the fact that when you leave power, you live to wage uh, the next campaign and return to power at a later date. Whenever a political party seeks to barricade itself in power, whenever you have a candidate, as we had a gubernatorial candidate in the Midwest in 2022, saying uh, to his political party as the reason why they should give him the nomination for governor, if you nominate me, I can guarantee you we won't lose political power again for decades. Uh, then you have a warning sign that democracy is in very deep trouble. So what's been happening to American democracy? Well, uh, if I had more time, uh, I could show you statistically with congressional voting patterns, but I think you know enough to take my word for it, that the Congress has become more uh, ideologically polarized, more separated and deeply divided into left and right political camps with um, less political overlap between the most conservative Democrat and the most moderate or liberal Republican. Indeed, there used to be a few decades ago, not that long ago, in fact, even well after Mike Mansfield retired from the Senate, some considerable overlap uh, in voting positions. The more uh, progressive or moderate Republicans had more liberal voting records than the most conservative Democrats. And then with each decade through the 80s and the 90s, that overlap has diminished to the point where it's non-existent. The most uh, conservative uh, Democrat in the House has a voting record that's more liberal than the most liberal Republican. Uh, that doesn't make it impossible uh, to forge compromises but it's a sign of challenge and difficulty. With this, of course, has become more obstruction and less productivity in Congress. We know that some people think that's a good thing, but we have a lot of problems facing the country. And a lot of people like me think it would be better if the, con if the Congress were m more capable of compromising to produce um, policy responses and legislation to deal with the real problems people are facing. Uh, and uh, if it could just do things like pass budgets uh, and uh, keep the United States from defaulting on its debt. Um, public opinion polls show that the people have become quite significantly more ideologically polarized uh, as well along partisan lines and that same distribution of how do you, the ideological assortment of Republicans on a left-right scale and of Democrats on a left-right scale, there used to be quite a lot of overlap and that overlap as well, uh, in particularly the two decades of this century has been diminishing. But I'll tell you something that's noteworthy, and please keep it in mind for a few minutes, the people are not as polarized, the, which is to say the American public in general, are not as polarized as the United States Congress. And in between are the people who are more politically active. And the people who are more politically active, who are more likely to vote, and crucially for where I'm headed, more likely to vote in party primaries, which you know, come earlier in the year, less consequential. Uh, and so they have lower turnout, um, often very low turnout, uh, often 15 or 20% of eligible voters voting in party primaries. They're much more polarized, those people who are more committed, follow politics more closely and vote regularly in party primaries. 
they're much more polarized than the general public. And that's one reason why the Congress has become so polarized, because the members of Congress now know that they can be, we actually have a verb for it now, primaried. And to be primaried means to be defeated in a low turnout party primary by an ideologically more extreme or committed or more militant um, wing of your party because you were not orthodox enough or were not uh, more ideologically uh, to the far left or the far right. Then we have the phenomenon that people have actually been politics and partisanship have become so important to them that they've actually been picking up and moving uh, their location, not only within states, but across states to uh, align more closely with their views. Uh, and so we have what um, uh, one uh, observer has called the big sort, where people, uh, both areas of the country are changing. Of course, the American South is the paradigmatic uh, indicator of this, which has gone from being the solid South in terms of solidly voting Democratic for many decades to the more or less solid South with some islands of um, diversity uh, now more solidly Republican. Uh, but people have been moving as well. And there are fewer and fewer swing districts and swing states so few that, as you know, the presidential election is generally determined these days and will be in 2024 in November um, by the votes of about seven states, probably, uh, that will be in play. And you can pretty well predict, sometimes we can be wrong, but we can pretty well predict today how at least 40 to 42 states are gonna vote in the presidential election. Beyond this, and this is really where the toxicity enters in, is the problem of what we call affective polarization. Affect, emotion. Uh, how much do you dislike, distrust the other side? If you're a Democrat, the Republicans. If you're a Republican, the Democrats. Um, we're now at a point where people would, public opinion polls show, rather have their son or daughter marry someone of a different race than of a different political party. And I'm not justifying any you know, kind of animus to um, how people would marry. I think parents should be open-minded in general, but this has become a kind of tribal consciousness uh, for many people. Uh, and they view someone of another party and another ideology and another political philosophy frequently, too frequently, and too intensely as of a different world and of a threatening world <clears throat> and of a world that um, they shouldn't have to tolerate and of a world that if those people should come to power would represent an existential threat to their values, to what they think is morally right, um, morally tolerable and morally acceptable. Democracy cannot long endure in a society where you have two political parties and where a substantial and growing proportion, even a majority, of the voters in each party regard the other party as an existential threat. Once that happens uh, and you view the other side as morally intolerable and objectionable, then it justifies anything to keep them from coming to power, including a violent assault on the Capitol to try and prevent the electoral college votes from being cast uh, a campaign of lies and disinformation about who won the election uh, and um, uh, a willingness to tolerate and condone political violence, 
in unwillingness to engage and talk to people with a different point of view and often very, very miserable Thanksgiving dinners. Um, and I've already mentioned the party, uh, the problem of the disproportionality of who turns out to vote in party primaries, that the people who turn out to vote are the ones who most feel this affect, this extreme and intense fear, emotion, anger, uh, and uh, uh, conviction that the other side is a mortal, mortal threat to everything they value. All of this is making the Congress more polarized. I urge you all to read the article that was just released today by Mitt Romney's biographer. Turns out that Mitt Romney has been in the process for months of speaking with disarming candor, which doesn't actually shock me uh, if you really know him, uh, to a biographer who's going to publish a biography of him soon. But much of what the biographer learned was published today in an article in The Atlantic. And Romney, um, who, whatever you think of his politics, one way or another, I think is, you know, one of the remaining kind of Mike Mansfield style honorable people in American politics today, um, actually had the courage, was the only Republican uh, who had the courage to vote to impeach Donald Trump uh, on the first uh, impeachment vote, I guess in 2019, maybe it was early 2020, uh, for which he was largely excommunicated by the Republican Party. And now, of course, you know, he's announced he's not going to run for re-election. Um, even though, as we know from a lot of, uh, if you're kind of inside the beltway, you hear a lot of this, but the article documents it, that a lot of his fellow Republican senators shared um, his disdain for President Trump and what President Trump had done in weaponizing uh, for political gain uh, the use of American aid to Ukraine. But uh, they were worried that verb again about being primary. And they didn't want to end their political careers and commit political suicide the way the first Republican senator uh, uh, to stand up to Donald Trump, uh, the conservative Barry Goldwater Republican from Arizona, Jeff Flake did uh, in 2018. Uh, uh, and I think Jeff Flake will go down in American history the way um, one of Mike Mansfield's peers, Margaret Chase Smith, um, will go down, has gone down in American history as a profile and courage for standing up to Joe McCarthy. So um, I can share with you a little data from American public opinion over the last two years. Um, one item from a December 2021 20, poll shows that nearly two thirds of Americans feel that American democracy is in crisis and at risk of failing. Unfortunately, as a political scientist, thinking analytically, I've already told you, I agree with them. A majority of supporters we know, a pretty significant majority of supporters who voted Republican uh, in the last election, reject the legitimacy of that election, believe it was uh, falsely believe. I think the evidence is now clear as it adjudicated in 80 juris, uh, judicial jurisdictions but still nevertheless believe that the election was rigged and that Trump really won the Electoral College. A majority of Americans lack confidence that elections in America today really reflect the will of the people. More Republicans than Democrats, but a lot of Democrats as well. 57% of Republicans, if you, you can have these slides if you want them, just ask the Mansfield Center. When you click on each of the underlined yellow words, you'll get a link to the evidence. 57% of Republicans, when the survey was done about a year and a half ago, view Democrats not as the political opposition, but uh, with different policies, but as, quote, enemies who, if they win, may threaten their way of life or even their life. 
and 41% of Democrats think that about Republicans. And a fifth of Americans believe to some degree uh, in polls we've done that violence can be justified to protect American democracy. Let me tell you, most of the 20% who give that response would never actually commit an act of violence. But when you have a large number of people creating a permissive atmosphere for that, and when you have the level of weaponry uh, that many angry people, and of course others have in the US, you, you have in itself a serious problem. What is driving political polarization and de decay in the United States? I think a lot of trends, people are hurting uh, economically. And let me tell you, uh, in my view, in terms of the stagnation of incomes, in terms of the shocking gravitation of the distribution of income and wealth in the United States to the richest 10%, even more the richest 1%, and even more disproportionately the richest one-tenth percent of the United States, that is going to be supercharged by the artificial intelligence revolution, which I believe actually is going to displace uh, a lot of labor and is going to create even more problems of economic marginalization if we don't turn around as your very visionary and forthright president of this uh, university uh, noted in an extremely important op-ed in the Washington Post back in May, if we don't reverse the trend of declining college and university enrollments in the United States. So rising economic and wealth inequality, growing economic marginalization, and a sense, you've all heard it, if not seen it, that a lot of people believe that their kids are not going to have the economic opportunities that they had, that they will and a lot of young people, they can't buy houses, they can't find good jobs. They kind of feel in their bones their life won't be as good as their parents. So we've got the job displacement, we've got technological change, we've got to lean into it with education and we're not adequately doing so. We've got the threats that people face of globalization taking jobs, of immigration creating um, a more diverse society. Uh, socially, religiously, in a lot of ways that we need to adapt to. I will tell you, as a social scientist, we need more labor. You know, we're an aging society. Um, but I think that immigration needs to be planned and regulated uh, and intentional and not just waves of people coming across the border. I actually think if our politics weren't so broken and so gripped by polarization, we could find compromise solutions to the immigration challenge that a lot of Americans would think are sensible, but we can't do it because it's one of the many third rails in American politics that Congress won't touch. We have a problem of racial bias and injustice longstanding in the United States in many dimensions in some parts of American society. That's a problem, and it's hard to, for people to uh, adapt to diversity. I've talked about the ge geographic sorting. Then we got social media, and you know what's going on with social media. The business model of the social media platforms is um, anger, outrage, and shock. How do the social media platforms earn their income? Basically in two ways, by selling ads, and accumulating and monetizing data, either by training their artificial intelligence or literally selling the data. How do they accumulate the data and how do they get the eyeballs uh, by, by having people remain on their websites as long as possible? And how do they get the uh, eyeballs to stay on the platform as long as possible in order to do this uh, shock, outrage, uh, indignation, and so on. Well, this is a lot of what is driving uh, our polarization now. Uh, and the social media companies are reluctant <laughs> to radically change their algorithms, the formulas that drive content, what you're going to see next and you know what gets elevated and whatnot. 
because it's their business model. And then finally, not finally, but I'll, it's the last thing I'll note for the moment, the decline of civic education in the United States. Uh, we have objective measures of this in terms of the levels of political knowledge of young Americans today compared to generations ago. A shocking number of young people, majority can't even name what the three branches of government are in the United States. And if you um, uh, survey them about their knowledge of the American Constitution, not to mention the quite impressive Montana Constitution, they really don't know a lot. So just conveying knowledge, not to mention cultivating norms of mutual tolerance and mutual respect and the art of having dialogue about contentious issues, uh, we're just not doing it. Uh, it's not surprising, therefore, as a result, that if you look at the trends in terms of the quality of democracy as measured by Freedom House or, you know, frankly, any of the other uh, organizations that do this on an annual basis, on a 100-point scale, American democracy has been declining. The decline did not start with Donald Trump uh, and his arrival in the presidency in 2017, but it accelerated with it, and it's been going on a while, and um, a lot of it is due to our political polarization and dysfunctionality. So what can we do to um, repair and renew our democracy? Uh, I'm not going to cover everything. I don't think anybody in this room will agree with everything I have to say, uh, but these are things I believe would make our democracy better, more democratic, um, more inclusive, uh, and um, less polarized. And when I talk in a moment about bringing uh, more Americans into the political process, getting more Americans to vote, I don't want you to think that I'm only thinking about one particular partisan or social group. Uh, this is a national problem of uh, low voter registration and particularly low voter turnout. And it just happens, if you look at the evidence, that the people who are um, who do not vote so often, they're less informed, true, uh, but they're also less militant. <laughs> they don't have such um, unforgiving and toxic views about the other political side often because they don't even have a political side, they're independents. And if you bring them into the electoral process, uh, you know, you will kind of dilute the influence of extreme to toxic and unforgiving, um, uncompromising partisans on both sides of the aisle. So I believe we need to strengthen and improve the impartiality and capacity of electoral administration, and obviously improve confidence in the process, make it easier to register and vote. I'm going to explain to you why I think ranked choice voting is the reform that will get the most mileage out of in terms of depolarization, particularly when combined with open primaries or an end to party primaries. And finally, I wanna talk about democratic uh, deliberation. I think it's a cardinal principle of democracy uh, that it requires neutral, fair, and hopefully professional electoral administration. I think some of you know this is under assault now. Uh, many uh, professional uh, career election administrators at the county and local level, as well as secretaries of state, um, are facing death threats. They've had their addresses published. They're getting calls in the middle of the night saying, I know where your daughter goes to school and when she gets out of X elementary school or whatever. Uh, and th they're having uh, traumatic stress disorders that require psychological care. It's not surprising that many of them are quitting uh, and that some jurisdictions are having trouble finding election workers. Um, I believe we should do more to uh, professionalize this. I've never thought that it made sense to have elected officials administering elections in many states. I would simply make it a neutral, bureaucratic, nonpartisan process. In particular, I believe it's important to end partisan gerrymandering of electoral districts and just have 
as you have in Montana, as we now have in California, uh, a bipartisan uh, or um, alternative process for drawing electro electoral district boundaries than having partisan state legislatures draw their own boundaries and try and favor their own reelection. And if one party is in control of government, entrench that control for all time. Um, we need more funding for election administration and modernization of equipment. I think it's uh, unfortunate that the Congress uh, has been um, reluctant to provide as much of it as the authorities feel they need. And um, I think it should be a federal crime to threaten or commit violence against any local or state uh, election official. Uh, there are things we could do uh, in this regard in terms of federal standards. Fortunately, a lot is being done. I don't want you to be too despairing. We're making a lot of progress. And the Congress did do something amazing last year to summon up uh, the bipartisan will, and it took a bipartisan coalition to pass a reform uh, of the Electoral Count Act so that we will diminish the chances of having another controversy and crisis like uh, in January of uh, 2021. But there's more we could do to modernize and establish uh, certain minimum common standards for electronic voting machines. Certainly, there should never be an election held in the United States that doesn't leave a paper trail where you can recount the vote if necessary, rather than just having to look at the machines that might have been contaminated. Uh, and it will help build confidence in elections if all jurisdictions will do what particularly a number of Republicans have called for, which I believe is appropriate and should be mandatory, which is risk limiting audits of all elections once they're held. The good news is that the Congress did pass and the president did sign a reform of the Electoral Count Act last year that clarifies that the role of the vice president is purely ceremony, ceremonial, that expedites, uh, puts on a fast track any federal judicial review of disputes over state elections for president, uh, that consolidates the process of choosing state electors and requires the Congress to defer to the state's choice once the courts have ru ruled, that makes it, uh, raises the threshold for the, uh, either House of Congress to object to a state's uh, electoral delegation and that narrows the state's ability to declare a failed election and disqualify it. Um, I'd like to uh, increase voter participation um, by, first of all, enfo enforcing the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I think the Supreme Court made a mistake to rule prematurely that preclearance for changes in certain states with records of problems wasn't necessary from the Justice Department. I think same-day registration we know would increase voter turnout. Make voting easier and you're gonna get more people voting. Make voting a national holiday, make it easier to vote. A lot of Republicans say, well, if you do that, you'll have people faking being somebody else and voting fraudulently. There's almost no evidence that this happens in the United States. In the majority of instances I've actually seen of this happening, it's actually been people who are voting Republican as in North Carolina who did this, but that doesn't matter. We wanna increase um, confidence in the process. And I have no problem requiring a photo ID to vote, but I think we have to spend the money to ensure that everybody, irrespective of their income, their race, their geographic location, will have that photo ID. I actually think having a federally recognized um, photo ID should be a right of every citizen in the United States. Uh, and if we do that, people will have a, another dimension of their citizenship rights and will increase confidence in elections. Now, how to reduce polarizing uh, realities in the US. 
the formula is, first of all, we have a two-party dominant system. Uh, it's a duopoly. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, the book um, uh, called, uh, gosh, what's the title by Catherine Gell and Michael Porter about the two-party duopoly. Uh, and, you know, duopolies are not actually healthy for competition, uh, but that's in a way embedded in our system. Uh, but we can change our system and change our electoral uh, incentives uh, and open up the process. Uh, the first past the post system that's used in the United States to choose virtually all officials at every level, state and federal, contributes to this because um, if you uh, just have one round of voting, most states don't have runoff elections then you don't want to waste your vote on a third party candidate. And so it's going to be a Democrat or a Republican, one of the two established parties. And then if you lose a party primary in most states in the United States, you can't even get on the ballot in the general election. It's something called the sore loser rule that prevails on the, uh, in most states. And then of course, again, social me media is making it worse. So I really believe that the most attainable reform we can get, because any state could adopt it on its own, actually for, for all elections, even to choose presidential electors, is ranked choice voting. It's a moderate reform because it doesn't change the system of choosing representatives in single member districts. It's still going to produce mainly two political parties that will be present in state legislatures in the Congress. Theoretically, it could make it possible for independents to get elected, more possible, or libertarians or Green Party or whatever else might be invented in the future. And I think that would be a good thing because I value competition. The value of ranked choice voting is if you actually like a libertarian more, or an independent more, whatever it might be, you don't waste your vote by voting for that candidate. Uh, if nobody gets a majority of the vote, then the candidate with the lowest number of first preference votes is eliminated. You see a simulation here. And then you have what's called an instant runoff. Uh, and then you the, the votes of the candidate who got eliminated are distributed to that candidate's voters' second choices. Uh, and uh, so it simulates a runoff election and you keep having these instant runoffs until someone emerges with the majority of the vote. We know from the hundred year experience of Australia using this to elect their lower house of parliament that this tends to produce more moderate outcomes, it tends to increase interest in elections because more parties can run uh, and to um, uh, reduce the kind of perverse outcomes of elections. A caller on um, Peter Christian's radio uh, show this morning said to me, well, uh, I don't think they called it communist. They had that adjective for some of the other things I was saying. But um, they did suggest that ranked choice voting was un-American, was in violation of our constitution and so on and so forth. I said very simply, if you believe in the possibility or value of a runoff election, which many states in the US have, then this is just an efficient way of doing runoff elections. You do it all at once and you don't have to have a, a second or even a third contest. It will improve voter choice. Uh, it can encourage broader coalition formation because in order to win, you can't just narrow cast to a, an ideological faction of the electorate, you have to have a majority to win. Uh, and so this will uh, make elections, I think, more competitive, uh, will make it more difficult for extreme candidates to win, particularly uh, uh, probably at the state level and thereby reduce polarization. I think we should put an end to partisan primaries and have open primaries or blanket primaries, the system uh, I like is the Alaska system, uh, which is called Final Four. Uh, voters vote in the primary and select, uh, vote for the candidate they most want. 
the top four candidates advance to the general election, and then ranked choice voting is used to choose the winner. That's how Lisa Murkowski got elected uh, in Alaska. If you are going to have partisan primaries, which I'd like to do away with, I think uh, losers should be able to run in the general election as independents if they want. Um, but um, Alaska adopted top four. Nevada uh, just had um, a voter initiative pass. Well, it has to pass twice because it's a constitutional amendment. Adopting final five, the top five candidates advance to the general election. And I'll kind of uh, speed up here by saying several states now, uh, Maine, Alaska, and Nevada have voted for ranked choice voting. 23 states have the voter initiative and could adopt it by grassroots mobilization. Minnesota is actually got, got a pretty serious movement in the state legislature to adopt ranked choice voting statewide. And states are doing other interesting things to end gerrymandering uh, and create bipartisan or nonpartisan commissions to redraw district boundaries, to institute automatic voter registration, uh, and so on. I want to uh, close with an initiative that we've had uh, out of Stanford uh, called deliberative polling. We have now done three national deliberative polls in which we draw together. This can be done at any level. Uh, Texas did it to uh, a quarter century ago to uh, think about whether it should encourage a shift to more wind power. Uh, communities have done it on contentious issues. We drew three national polls in 2019, 2021 on environment and climate change and energy and 2023, this past June on democratic reform in the US, including ranked choice voting. And we drew a random sample in the American public, asked them what they thought about these different issues, but that was only the beginning. After they filled out the poll, we sent them a briefing booklet uh, that had been vetted by diverse experts with different points of view uh, and with pro and con arguments about all these issues. And then we brought them together. Initially, these are some of the people in person in Dallas, Texas in September 2019. And then uh, the last two times over a Zoom-like uh, internet gathering uh, in 2021 and 2023, uh, we used random samples. Um, people would uh, deliberate after they read the briefing booklets in small groups of about 10 to 12 people. And there were only a few ground rules. You had to listen to other people. You couldn't just uh, engage in a monologue with your own point of view you had to um, respect other views and not use uh, abusive language. Uh, and um, you uh, had to see if you could cooperate on a common task, in this case, formulating questions that would be posed to experts uh, that the whole sample would listen to in plenary session. You know, it's amazing what you can do uh, to break down barriers when people have to cooperate on a task, even a task as, similar, as, as trivial as what questions do we want the experts to answer? Anyway, uh, I'm gonna show you a few results here. Before deliberation, 35% of Republicans, 41% of Democrats, six, uh, of independents, 69% of Democrats, believe we should restore federal and state voting rights to people convicted of felonies after they'd been released for prison. That jumped from 35 to 58% for Republicans, 41 to 57% for independents and a more mo modest increase for Democrats. What about uh, nonpartisan redistricting? Republicans increased from 33 to 55%. Democrats from 58 to 71 percent, allowing citizens to vote online. Again, when people had a chance to read about it, listen to different points of view, deliberate with one another, whatever their political orientation, uh, they increased dramatically. And what you see is the difference between the parties narrowed. 
Um, and now ranked choice voting. I'll just focus on the bottom one of ranked choice voting for congressional elections. Republicans were still against it. Republicans have uh, kind of, you know, taken this uh, point of view, um, which I think is, they, they think it's going to hurt their chances. I, I, I don't think that's a logical position. But in any case, they did increase from 32 to 40 percent. Democrats went from 60 to 65 percent. In, independents increased a lot. And how about that top four system that Alaska has? Republicans went from 32 to 42 percent. Democrats from 59 to 63 percent. In the end, major, minorities of the American public favored ranked choice voting before deliberation, pooling all of them 42 to 44 percent. And afterwards, about 55% of the American public thought ranked choice voting would be a better, more democratic system. Here's the thing that most shocked me. We asked people in the survey, how satisfied are you with the way democracy is working? And if I asked you if you were satisfied or not, a lot of people here, I think, would raise their hands no. Before the deliberation, 19% of Republicans 27% of independents and 34% of Democrats said they were satisfied with the working of democracy in the United States. After the survey, all they did was read the briefing papers, listen to the experts and deliberate with their fellow citizens. Republicans went from 19% to 50% in their level of satisfaction with democracy in the United States. Democrats went from 34 to 46%. They were very positive about every uh, element of the survey. And um, we asked them, well, do you think it would be a good idea to have more people in the US deliberating like this on issues confronting their communities, including high school and college students? And you can see in particular this big jump among Republicans from 52 to 82 percent. We're now thinking about how to scale up deliberation, including to schools, community organizations, religious congregations, rotary clubs, uh, and so on. Maybe you can help us with that. Finally, we really need to survive, uh, revive civic education in the United States. This is one of my favorite co quotes from the Democratic philosopher, uh, Sidney Hook positive requirement of a functioning democracy is, note the careful language here, an intelligent distrust of its leadership, a skepticism, not a rejection, a skepticism, stubborn but not blind, of all demands for the enlargement of power, and an emphasis here, what better place to say that on a, than on a university campus, an emphasis upon the critical method in every phase of education and social life. These are some of the democratic norms we need to defend. I've referred to them. I don't think I need to rearticulate them. These are some organizations that I think are working to uh, try and address these issues. And I'll just mention that the Mansfield Center is one of them. So I hope you'll support it on its 40th anniversary. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. So Professor Diamond has agreed to take some questions and uh, Chloe is out there, right there. There's Chloe. She has a mic, I have a mic and we will circulate around. You can just raise your hand um, if you'd like to ask Professor Diamond a question, but I am going to start with one that we got from the folks out there on Zoom. And uh, this first question, Professor Diamond, what's the single most important thing that we can do just as everyday citizens, right? Not our leaders who might be in a position to pass ranked choice voting, but just everyday citizens uh, to, to, to help save our democracy. Well, uh, I could say, you know, work for reform of our institutions, the way we vote, um, the ability to vote, uh, to broaden it, increase confidence in it, and so on. But taking it down to the most micro level, um, promote mutually respectful dialogue 
across diversity. And diversity in every respect, including diverse points of view. And on a university campus or in a high school, or even middle school, uh, try to bring back civic education and the art of dialogue and debate, of mutually respectful, critical inquiry, thoughtful deliberation, open-minded listening, dialogue and debate. So because you brought up uh, civic education, we had another one on Zoom asking about that. And um, are there some models out there that of, of places that have done this effectively? And, and where do we really need this? Is this uh, just across the board? Are we talking uh, uh, high school level, college level? Um, and, and, and what would a serious effort at tackling civic education at the level of uh, uh, a given community, what, what would that look like? Well, there are a lot of tools and models. Um, I'm familiar with an institution called the Center for Civic Education in Calabasas, California. And I was involved, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago when they produced something which may still survive online called an international framework uh, for democratic civic education, something like that. But I, I thought it was pretty good for the United States too. And um, uh, I can't tell you what places are, are doing it well because uh, education is, uh, isn't really my, my specialization, but I can make the following points. Number one, uh, I think, you know, I, I come from an era in which we started having elections in grammar school. I ran every election I could when I was in school. I was a homeroom president. I lost for student body president in junior high school. I won in high school. You win some, you lose some, right? But in any case, um, you know, having students vote, uh, but also debate in mutually respectful ways and practice democracy, intern in community organizations, do public service. Um, I think that's part of it. Uh, and it's a really important part of it at the college and university level. But in addition, um, I think we've really got to go back to work on the ABC basics of uh, just knowledge of our political system. It shouldn't be a Republican and Democratic issue for people to know what the three branches of, of government are in the United States or in any democracy and what the content of our constitution is, you know, and I think we can um, bridge some divides just by having a neutral fact-based curriculum uh, that we try and get at least some purchase on across the partisan divide on the core content for the knowledge we want to uh, convey. So uh, we really need to go to work on that in our communities. And while I think we can develop templates, models and resources at a national level, and I'm pretty sure they already exist, um, you know, every community has got to have some ownership and feel some authenticity here. I will say as well, I think it's becoming very urgent that we educate young people in how to use social media and detect and avoid disinformation. We actually have um, a social science history education group at Stanford that's developed a lot of curriculum in, in general for civic education, but has done some very innovative work on how to um, educate young people in um, using the internet intelligently and responsibly, not to take at face value everything that pops up on their screen. And in fact, old people, older people like myself are worse in this than young people. Um, hi, uh, this is a somewhat unrelated question and I apologize for the fact that I might be about to drop a rather incendiary term on your doorstep, That's but fine. would you describe the bent away from the value of democratic norms recently as somewhat fascistic? As what? 
uh, fascistic. Fascistic. Yeah. Um, I try. So if you accuse someone of being fascist or fascistic or communist, uh, because maybe they believe in um, Medicare for all, um, you know, it's it's a loaded word and it polarizes the conversation. So I don't use those words because I don't want to throw fuel on the fire of polarization. But as a social scientist um, who has studied fascism, the rise of fascism, not as intensely as the historical and philosophical experts on it, I think there are illiberal populists in Europe and the United States in particular, who are engaging in narratives and styles of demonization, manipulation, and stoking of prejudice, fear, and extremism, and spinning narratives of hostility and contempt for political pluralism, for the core idea that plural points of view exist and are legitimate in a society, um, there are um, extreme illiberal populist politicians and parties in Europe and uh, actors or pieces of parties in the US um, who are very similar to the tactics and narratives of the classic fascist parties of old in Europe. And so I'm being very clinical here. Uh, and um, that's as far as I'd wanna go. I'm not gonna call uh, people who I'm deeply troubled by, but hold political office fascist because I don't think it gets us to where we want to get to in terms of depolarizing our democracy, but that's my social science answer to your question. Dime. Mr. Diamond, over here, Jinder, okay. nice, nice to uh, thank you for taking time and making the effort and sharing. Uh, as a human connection expert, I'm actually a speaker and okay. fascinated by what you shared today. I would love to know what you are optimistic about. What I'm optimistic about um, is, first of all, that when you bring Americans together in one room with good sources of information that have been vetted by alternative experts and um, walk them through rational arguments for and against even contentious issues, um, people can narrow their differences, but more so empty or at least diminish from their gut the poison of tribal animosity. I have seen it happen. If you um, Google the CNN clip about our American one room deliberation in Dallas, Texas. I mean, nothing conveys what we achieve better than, you know, that four and a half minute clip that uh, Fareed Zakaria showed on a Sunday show after, but CNN spent the whole weekend with us in Dallas. And you had, you know, rabid Trump supporters, you know, pretty left-wing liberals, um, African Americans, uh, you know, who'd never had this kind of conversation with a white person before, white people who'd never met an undocumented immigrant before. I mean, people kind of opened up and um, something dramatic happened. And so I'm optimistic that it can happen. Now, we as social scientists and as a center at Stanford have to figure out a way to scale this up. We're starting to think about this, but there are techniques 
for promoting civil conversations. And, um, you know, if we can get back to the Tuckvillian vision of a society of people engaged in vigorous but not merciless uh, dialogue and debate, and crucially of cross-cutting cleavages, part of the problem is that we're not interacting across difference in, in, anymore. We're retreating into our media and social and geographic you know, bubbles. So that's one thing I'm optimistic about. The second thing I'm optimistic about is that uh, when you give people a chance to consider some of these institutional reforms to depolarize our politics, um, uh, in a number of instances, they like it and have adopted it. And um, we're not gonna amend the American constitution uh, in ways that a lot of people think would be magic bullets for making America less po polarized or more democratic precisely because you know we've got deep divisions. We're not gonna get two thirds agreement in the Congress for any of this, not to mention majority of the states. But once states start, more states and more states start experimenting and adopting reforms and you get grassroots mobilization and so on, uh, and you take it out of the kind of national arena and people just start thinking about the logic of it, the value of it in their own local and state context, um, I believe we can actually get very promising change. After all, that's how we got uh, gradually um, uh, a lot of other reforms, uh, including expansion of the franchise, direct democracy, uh, direct election of senators, and so on and so forth. Good evening, Professor. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I have uh, noticed that you didn't mention money in elections. And I was thinking to myself that maybe some people might think that with all the corporate and wealthy people's money in elections and uh, and influence our, influencing our politicians, they might think that they shouldn't even bother to vote. Could you please comment? Yes. Um, there are multiple reasons um, why I didn't mention it. Uh, one is that I thought I'd prepared a half hour lecture and you saw I spoke for about 50 minutes. I apologize for that. Uh, I knew I was gonna run over anyway. Number two, um, I actually think it's very hard to figure out what should be done and I'll explain to you why. Um, I do not agree with the Supreme Court decision equating the expenditure of campaign money with free speech. Um, but I, under our constitutional system, until the Supreme Court rules differently, I respect it. It's, it's the constitution uh, now uh, that the Supreme Court has interpreted. With that um, interpretation, it has become, and tossing aside McCain-Feingold, much harder to regulate money in politics. I mean, I used to think that, um, uh, you know, there were limits to how much money an individual can give. Uh, I think, and the limits in theory keep rising. I think it used to be 2,000, 2,500, now it's maybe 27 or 2,800 that you can give to a national uh, federal election candidate uh, in any primary or general election cycle. But if you're on a donation list for a Republican presidential candidate, a Democratic presidential candidate, you'll be asked to give $25,000. And people are... ...invited to give $100,000. Well, how the because of the rise of political action committees and their freedom to work in parallel to spend as much money as they want. 
Now, there's a second reason. You'd think, uh, from one perspective, that the answer is to empower small donors. I thought so until very recently. Uh, and that is, let's have the Seattle system of giving voters four $25 vouchers to give to whatever candidates they want or um, make it tax deductible to give uh, up to $100, $200 or whatever to candidates. Um, half of me still likes this, but the other half of me that's the social scientist has seen the very recent social science data showing that the people who make these small donations are the same people who are more inclined to vote in primary elections. And they are the people further to the left and further to the right who are polarizing our politics. And um, there is a real danger if you do that, that you will actually make political polarization worse and empower the extremes on the right and left. There's something else. Actually, in my later years, I've gotten to know a number of members of Congress uh, and other politicians, but particularly Congress, and watching this depressing, unseemly ritual of them having to walk across the street from the Capitol building to a windowless room that's rented by the Democratic Party for their set, and the Republican party for their set so they can spend hours and hours calling people asking for money it's um uh, it is just so depressing that they're having to spend so much time doing that and i've actually come to believe you're probably going to not like what i'm going to say now but many of us who are on a task force of political and social scientists and law professors who've been looking at this problem of polarization and how we can rescue our democracy have come to believe actually we would improve democracy and reduce polarization by raising pretty significantly the limits on individual contributions uh, that people can make to donor to uh, candidates so that they can be more efficient in raising money and so um, that, uh, you know, you might actually have um, a, a consolidated process. I know it sounds strange, but the social science evidence suggests it might actually reduce polarization. But we're really in Terry incognita here. It's the hardest problem um, with uh, um, uh, depolarizing politics and campaigns. I would favor dramatic expansion of federal funding, but you know, you're know you never gonna get the American public to agree to the levels of federal funding that you would need in order to, um, to really make a difference and incentivize people to not take uh, private money. So it, it's a very, very thorny issue. And I am suspicious of most people who think they have found the answer to the dilemma. I'm not actually the one making these decisions, uh, but I know you've I'm had sorry. your hand up oh. very passionately. Go ahead. Thank you for, for coming here, Professor. It's been an honor having you here at our campus. Oh, thank you. Given the historical precedent of third parties spoiler effect to major parties and the lack of resources like money that third parties can pull from, how would ranked choice voting change the precedent of a duopoly? duopoly? Well, um, it would make it possible for third parties to seriously contest without the danger of them being spoilers. Let me give you a concrete example. An organization um, that I think has done a lot of good in the United States uh, in trying to depolarize the Congress, no labels, is now uh, exploring the possibility of running a bipartisan ticket 
for president, not as a third party, but a third alternative with a Republican and a Democrat running together. It's a big debate in the United States about whether this would be good for democracy or bad for democracy. I mean, in principle, I always think more choice is a good thing for democracy. Most pollsters, independent pollsters and political science experts on public opinion um, think, most of the ones I've talked to anyway, uh, that this would probably assure the reelection of Donald Trump. It is certainly the case that a lot of the money to qualify uh, this option for the ballot in many states is coming from Trump supporters. Um, now, I do not uh, at all favor the efforts that the Democratic Party establishments in many states are making uh, to uh, suppress this alternative. I think that is also uh, even more so undemocratic. Uh, they have a right to do it. I just think if you're worried, um, it's a nonpartisan statement, it's a purely analytical statement. If you are worried about Donald Trump being elected again because you think he might be a threat to American democracy, and if you believe that whatever deficiencies of the two most likely nominees, Trump and Biden are, or even their threats to democracy, that they're not equivalent um, and that one is worse than the other, um, then you have to worry about the spoiler effect. Now, if we had ranked choice voting, it wouldn't matter uh, because, well, let's say we didn't have the Electoral College and we had um, a direct election for president, or even let's just say you're talking about the electoral votes in Wisconsin and it's, it's Trump and Biden and well, it looks like Cornell West is running as the Green Party candidate. That itself could could spo be very significant spoiler. Um, but then there's a, another candidate. Um, you wouldn't have to worry because if no one got a majority of the vote, the candidate with the lowest number of first preference votes would be eliminated and his or her votes would be transferred um, to the voters' second preferences. And this would continue uh, until someone won a majority, the spoiler effect ends. And one reason why I'm uh, so passionately in favor of ranked choice voting actually is beyond any argument about depolarization. I just think it's more democratic. People ought to have more choice. Uh, and um, ranked choice voting will offer voters more choice. We do have to make this the last question. I, I see we got one more, and I know there are a few hands that we didn't get to. I apologize for well, that. I'll stick around. For I you. do, yeah. I, I do think uh, Professor Diamond has agreed to stick around. So if you didn't get your question asked, um, feel free to come on up and uh, and chat with him afterwards. Okay. Hi, um, over here. Where are you? Right here. Okay. There. Hi. Um, my question is: Do you think that the wealth distribution and capitalism in the U.S. today? can successfully coexist with a healthy and fair democracy? Those are two different questions. Um, I don't think you can have a healthy democracy or really a democracy at all without capitalism because the absence of capitalism is the absence of private property, which I think is actually uh, an inalienable right that individuals should have, but also um, the right to own property, the right to invest, the right to form a business, the right to innovate, the right to make a profit, a reasonable profit, um, is um, the secret to economic success. And the countries that haven't had that, <laughs> you know, or countries like Cuba and North Korea, uh, the Soviet Union and so on. Uh, they're not economic success stories. Um, capitalism can coexist um, with varying degrees of um, state participation, but I think state participation in production is generally a very bad idea in terms of economic efficiency. 
and it can coexist with different levels of, of taxation. And countries are, you know, constantly experimenting. If you raise taxes too high, you're going to stifle uh, innovation and investment. And in a global marketplace, capital will migrate to where it can make more money. And there go your jobs and there goes your engine of, of economic growth and upliftment. The issue that has, I think, become relevant and is not embedded in capitalism, yes or no, is the issue of the distribution of wealth and income. And there, I think, there is a, a proper role uh, for taxation and a proper role for um, uh, antitrust legislation uh, to think about this. Uh, and to try and level uh, inequality, uh, not to wipe it out, but to keep it within reasonable boundaries. And I am not an economist. Uh, this begins to get into deeply philosophical questions uh, about uh, what makes sense. My preference is to have relatively low corporate tax rates and let corporations, you know, really innovate and invest and so on, but, you know, raise the uh, overall um, uh, income tax rate so that you can uh, attenuate inequality and have public invest, have the money, first of all, to um, reduce our national debt, which is, I think, an existential threat to our future, but invest in infrastructure human uh, well-being, uh, education, uh, and so on. Um, you know, uh, state universities are in very big trouble right now. Uh, their state legislatures are not funding them to the level that's needed. And um, if you get a situation where the state universities don't have the money to subsidize uh, or eliminate tuition for lower income students, and pretty radically so, that itself is a problem. Uh, and it takes money to do that. So, um, you know, societies is, is one of the most enduring and agonizing problems for public policy in a democracy what the tax rate should be and how it should be structured. And kind of pragmatism and empirical inquiry of what works and what doesn't has to coexist with the contention between different philosophies. But one thing I think is not, cannot be at issue um, is uh, the relationship between capitalism and democracy, a system of uh, competition uh, and private enterprise to create a, a economic growth uh, and um, enhance livelihoods has been long since proven to be the best formula for economic prosperity uh, and a critical foundation for democracy. Well, I guess that's it. Thank you. Yeah, we we uh, we just heard from the leading expert in the country on democracy. It's a treat. I would remind you, September 27th, Marie Ivanovich, October 5th, Liz Cheney and Governor Roscoe. One more round of applause for Larry Diamond, please. Thank you for coming out.